Welcome back to the video series where we work through the Kaggle competition on credit card fraud detection. In this video, I'll show you how to improve your leaderboard score by using neural networks. We'll learn embeddings for each of the categorical columns, and then we'll process the numerics using standard transformations that will help stabilize training. For more content like this, subscribe at blog.zachjost.com. The first step in building a neural network model is getting your data in the appropriate format. In this case, I took some of the numeric columns and passed them through a log transformation, and that was in an effort to reduce the impact of some of their extreme values. Whenever you have a variable representing money, distances, or raw counts, those are often good candidates for log transformations. I then take all of the numeric and apply this standard scalar from scikit-learn. And this just subtracts the mean and divides by the standard deviation. The point of this step is to make all of the numeric columns operate on roughly the same scale, and this should help stabilize the training process. Now that I've enforced that the mean value be zero for each of the numeric columns, I can take all of the missing and fill it in with zero, which is the same as filling it in with the mean. For the categorical data, I fill all of the missing in with this bracket unknown character sequence. I then take any category that occurs less than 100 times in the training set and overwrite it with the value bracket rare. So I do this because it will greatly reduce the number of parameters in my neural network, and that's because I'm going to be learning lookup embeddings for every categorical column. That means each unique category will have its own embedding, and it just doesn't make sense to store parameters for categories that are rarely seen and will likely not add any benefit to the model. To make use of lookup embeddings, I need to map each category to an integer. The reason for this is a lookup embedding is just a matrix, where the number of rows is equal to your number of unique categories, and the number of columns is equal to your desired embedding dimension. So by mapping every category to an integer, that just tells me which row to look at in the matrix. So I loop through each of the categorical columns and create a new column that has the same name but with underscore code added to it. And the code just assigns an integer to each category. There's one nuance here in that I add plus one, and that's because this pandas categorical D type will map out of vocabulary elements to negative one. So for categories never seen in the training data, they'll get a value of negative one. I want to reserve a slot for this in my embedding. So I go ahead and just add one so that all of those will be mapped to the first row in the embedding matrix. I then go through and figure out how many unique categories are in each column. And then I apply this rule of thumb that if you take the cubic root of this number and round it to the nearest integer, that should be your embedding dimension. So card one has 721 unique values after I overwrite the rares. And the cubic root of that rounded to the nearest integer is five. So that means my card one embedding will be a matrix of 721 rows and five columns. So with a given card one value, I can look up its integer code. And that code tells me which row to go to in the matrix. And then the five values in the columns represent the embedding for that. All right, so let's build the model. I create this raw transaction embedding class. So this will take all of the raw input as we just saw above and turn that into an embedding. You can see this code in more detail on GitHub, but briefly, I loop through each of the categorical columns and create a lookup embedding. And to create this embedding, I need to specify the number of unique categories and my desired output dimension. And again, I use the cubic root rounded to the nearest integer, which is all stored in a dictionary that I'm passing in. And then I have an option for adding dropout to this. The forward pass of this network will loop through each of the categorical columns and pass the codes into the lookup embedding layer to extract the actual embedding. It then flattens all of those embeddings together and into this net variable. I then concatenate that along with all of the numerics, so I have a single embedding vector that's all of my categorical embeddings combined 
and all of the numerics tacked on to the end. And then if there's dropout, I apply that. To create my actual model for training, I use this hybrid sequential object, which allows me to stack blocks together sequentially. My first object is my raw transaction embed class that I just defined. And the output of that raw transaction embedding is given to a dense layer. I'm using 64 units here. An activation function is applied, and then that's fed into the final output node for classification. So if you look at this network, the raw transaction has its columns sliced out. In this case, it's taking the 24th column out, and it's using that in the ID14 embedding lookup. And it's doing that for each of the categoricals and then concatenating their output embeddings together. It then takes the numeric and then concatenates that into this one large vector. Dropout is applied. Here's the 64 unit dense layer. Relu activation and my final output. I did essentially no tuning and just picked some parameter values. After the first epic, I'm getting an AUC on the holdout set of about 0.89. If I continue training for several epics, I can get the holdout AUC to be around 0.92. I'm sure with tuning you could do better, but you see the validation curve is a little bit noisy but seems to have mostly converged here so I don't expect continued training would get me a lot better performance. I wanted to visualize what these transaction embeddings looked like so I went ahead and scored the validation set. So if you add all of the categorical embeddings and the numeric values together you get 451 dimensions and I have about 30,000 samples here. So if you project that down into two dimensions and then color code by fraud or not fraud, you get some pretty interesting structure where there's a lot of clusters here and all of the fraud is not kind of randomly dispersed but concentrated in particular areas, which makes it easier to identify. To check whether or not transactions that are close together are similar, I went ahead and picked one of these kind of interesting structures like this line here. And if you look at the raw data for the points in this line, you see that first of all, they occurred reasonably close in time, that they have identical transaction amounts, that they have the same product code, the same card one, card two, card three, card four. You know, there's, these are essentially identical transactions for many, many variables, same email domains. There are some differences like this ID 33 which appears to be like a screen size, but on the whole, these look like remarkably similar transactions. You can also look at the embeddings for the individual categorical columns. If you look at ID31, its embedding is two dimensions, so we can directly plot that. And it appears to be some sort of operating system. And there's definitely some interesting structure here. So for instance, Chrome 52.0 for Android and Chrome 50.0 for Android are sort of close together. Here's Chrome 56.0 for Android. And then kind of in the center here, you see a lot of Firefoxes. So Firefox generic, 60.0, um, 59.0. And then up in the upper right corner, you see IE 11.0 for desktop, IE 11.0 for tablet. Uh, some mobile safari stuff. It's pretty remarkable to step back and think that just by looking at fraudulent and legitimate transactions we're able to recover structure about similarity in operating systems. When I score this model in the test set and submit it directly I get an AUC around 0 .905 in the leaderboard. Since this is substantially worse than my tree ensemble I wanted to give it less weight. So I just kind of arbitrarily chose a value of 0.2 to calculate this weighted average of my original submission with the output of this network. And when I do that, I get a leaderboard score of 0.9419. And my tree ensemble by itself was 9407. So a pretty substantial improvement from including this neural network with very little tuning work. So please reach out if you have any questions about using neural networks or if you have any advice on how I might be able to get better performance out of this one. Alright, see you next time.